do my best and uh, we'll see some of them are um, type of kind of interesting questions some of them are a little bit far far fetched so uh, question number one th uh, is structural organization of visual and speech sensory input to the brain how brain stores and process information that's a big question <laughs> okay so uh, well I mean what do we know about brain structure and function right I mean that's where we have to start so anyone want to tell me how is brain organized very general question but you you know some of it I've covered it how is brain organized I said, forget it. I'm a very rational scientist. You know, one of you came talking to me about dreams. Said, Phew. okay, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. So I stay out of where I don't have expertise. So meaning of life, you got me. I I will not be able to ta talk to you about meaning of life. Um, oh, there is some uh, question. Uh, we are certainly ready to take that. As a physics major, I'm interested in material science, and if you can please give me insight into possible application of materials, etc., uh, various things. Okay, so very good question. Honestly, if I were to choose the engineering which I think has the best potential, I would choose materials because I think it's so damn important to everything biomedical, uh, you know. Their materials are central. You make electrodes, you make stent, uh, whatever. It's and in my days, uh, the field used to be called metallurgical engineering. was so boring, uh, you know. And now it's material science and engineering and nanoscale and all of that. And it's just a incredibly revolutionary interact intersection of physics, materials, <coughs> chemistry, for biology and other fields. So it's a really great field to be in. Okay, and a physics major or chemistry major or they, they can all make lateral switch because you know physics, chemistry, math, I mean of course they are fundamental to all engineering and engineering is foundation to applications and so on. So I think these are perfectly reasonable. It does take a bit of an effort to shift gears, right, because physics departments teach you about astronomy and subatomic particles and quantum mechanics and all of that, although they do teach you more traditional physics like you know optics and you know materials you know, strength of materials and mechanics and properties and all of that so uh, I would say material science engineering is great um, physical principles as chemical or something are very appropriate the way to make shift is of course your one chance is to go through graduate school and you apply to graduate program if you're a good undergrad with good strong physical science to computing back you know math background material script department probably could accept it I would say to cement that further it would be a good idea to do a project a thesis research project uh, BTEC project summer internship whatever it is to show that your your shift is meaningful otherwise it might seem like young people's kind of like wild dream let me try that and then you might just back off so top tier good good uh, graduate schools uh, definitely expect a lot of uh, research skills, proven track record in research. At Johns Hopkins, you know, our PhD program, we get 400 applications for eventually about 25 admissions, so about 50 offers, about 80 to 100 are off invited for interviews. So, you know, with that, it's selective, not as horrible as it sounds, but somebody at IIT with a 9 out of 10, 8.5, 9.5 has done BTEC undergrad summer internship project generally would be competitive but if anything that could hold them back is uh, that they haven't done good quality research you know some kind of low level industry attachment is not helpful <coughs> <coughs> so I, you know those are the few things I don't know you did you, is this your situation or somebody else asked me anyway have I answered that question anymore anything else 
Any of you, uh, let me ask you, any of you applying to graduate schools thinking about going further in life? Yeah, so, okay, so uh, let me, first, first and foremost, I'm here to answer question, right? I can give monologue, but you know, one cap doesn't fit all. So uh, what I describe may or may not answer your questions, but I almost started to give a hint on how to apply and be successful in graduate school. Well, in absence of anything, obviously the first thing people look at, which college you graduated from, it's known standards, the college is less known, then you need to have other factors. College is well known, you get a little advantage. As an international student, uh, in India it's mostly gates and all that, so it's different. So then, you know, it's natural tendency to start looking at GPA, you know. People who have 9 plus GPA out of 10, I mean, they get a pretty much automatic recognition. But then see below that, you have to start improving your credentials by some factors. It doesn't mean nine or eight is a magical number, but it gives you a hint. In US language, it's translated into 3.2 to 3.6 out of four GPA. And so that's how typical Americans would think. 3.6 are about top 25% students because of grade inflation, and 3.2 might be about 50%. So you know, it's not like at a, at a top university. So for a high quality university, Given the great inflation, eight to nine is not such a bad thing, right? Although in IIT, I don't know what the grading inflation is, but you know, if you have ranked, make sure you, you let people know what your rank is because that matters a lot. You know, because of, again, people cannot fully judge what the grade inflation is. So because of that, even any university, if you went and you're let's say top ranked student, that may mean something because for various reasons, Let's say you didn't take a lot of coaching classes and didn't go to IIT. You know, nowadays it's changed, right? It wasn't the case in my days. But nowadays, coaching makes so much difference. So that, you know, everybody understands some of that. Some people just can't get in. But they can still be a top student at Anna University or Manipal or Delhi or Bombay University. And, you know, that would be very helpful. But nowadays, there's so many new universities that have come up deemed universities and this and that, it's becoming very difficult to calibrate Indian students. Uh, and in that case, you all have real challenge because your universities are going to be increasingly less and less known. And they're very American, Canadian, British, Canadian, British, all the Australia, they're very happy to take your money and admit you and see what happens. Um, but to get a scholarship at a top tier university, you need strong academic record minimally. Uh, GRE scores are used in lieu of as a way to calibrate. A good or great GRE score doesn't help too much, but a bad GRE score probably would help. We rarely see applicants from India who don't have 80, 90, 95, 98% math score, you know, so it's pretty universal. Analytical goes all over the place and we don't tend to think too much about it. <coughs> Again, three analytical score obviously will be bad, but 4.5 to 6, I don't care. And verbal, 30 percentile, terrible, but if you get 60, 80, 90, good enough. So GRE is kind of nice support. Not, not taking GRE means, oh, you're escaping that. So it may not help, but take a GRE, but that doesn't, don't count on a top tier GRE. It's the only way to get admitted. So then comes what you have done with your life. And that means the projects, internship, BTEC projects, summer internship, things you have done that are meaningful would help a lot. And so in that case, take your you know, internship and summer internship and BTEC projects very seriously. There, what happens is a lot of Indian students have a tendency to inflate things too much. Uh, you know, every little things they've done, they write it up as a project and fill the pages. It dilutes their story. You know, in life we can do one or two great things, you know, and so one excellent project done very well as a undergraduate is so much better than in my school I did this, and my first year I did this, second year I did this, and my hostel I did this, and then I played music, and I played cricket, and I'm captain, and I'm debated, and I, you know, it clutters it up. It doesn't let us tell you, know what you're excellent at. So I just now replied to a student uh, for an internship. So uh, an email such as, uh, oh boy, where is it? Sent email, let's try that. Mm. 
you know, it, it's revealing of it. Such tunes kind of capture interest and attention. Okay, here. Uh, some of research opportunities, student from IIT Bombay. Nice way to word it because that catches my attention quickly. I'm from IIT Bombay, so I have a little bias, but IIT has a bias. And if not, you can still catch attention. So, I am a second year student uh, pursuing a major in electrical engineering. Purpose is to reach out to explore research guidance, what not. I have excelled in courses like probability, data analysis, complex analysis, linear algebra, calculus, diffie network theory. My interests include machine learning, optimization, graph theory, etcetera. I am fascinated by my research, various things I have done. And I have completed an online course in machine learning from Stanford. Uh, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I'm doing some project under the guidance of Professor So and So at IIT Bombay, and it's kind of like math-heavy thing. Mm, I got my attention, you know, because you play to your strength. I mean, you know, it's sometimes hard in India and even IIT is particular to do very complicated biology or things require expensive experimental equipment. Doing cognitive psychophysics, neuroscience, you know, it can you know. So that's the strength, and I immediately connected with my uh, colleague who does network theory and all those other things. So, I think play to your strength and show off uh, in a measured way that you excel at something. Either your top grades, your inner ability, that catches attention of a really good project. Should this student, I said, well, you know, internship is too short. Start working on a project now, then it can mature as a, uh, as a summer student and it might it be if he does the internship two months, he'll get a bit of recommendation letter from him. If he works for six to eight months, he'll probably write a paper. He'll go to a top, better tier, top tier university. So that's how graduate admissions work. Learn to write a really good, succinct essay, part visionary, part tactical. Like, why do you want to do graduate work at some place in particular, with some professor? But don't be too precise because you know you c your interest can change. And uh, you know, recommendation letters matter, but you know that nowadays we get a lot of inflated recommendation letters. So very informed letters are very helpful. People who really know you well and talk to your ability and your talent. So we look at it. I mean, we look at six, seven matrix, academic record, GRE scores, recommendation letters, your own essay, and definitely evidence of research. So that's how we do at Johns Hopkins. We see the wholesome picture. At MIT, the, when I write recommendation letter, it comes out saying, is this student best ever, best in last five, 10 years, top 1% and then everybody else. They are raising the bar very high, you know. So best ever out of my 200 students, that's a tough measure to come, you know, and so on. But that's how top universities work and others have a different measures. But in the end, they're looking for high achieving people with real interest and commitment to match and fit into this program, okay? So, quick synopsis on graduate schools, how to apply, what to do. Any questions? Okay. Well, I would rather react because I don't want to give monologues about careers. Uh, should I talk about how to not to get a job and make no money? and then go home and be liability to your parents. Because some of you are saying that since you have no interest in jobs, careers, which means you're gonna go home and you tell your parents to feed you every single day. Okay, how to do that? So anybody else, any other career type, education type questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here in MIT, it is not so much limited, but they, they are learning. So, how I can design myself 
Yeah, your your advice is right, and you are also looking like making good decision, because you know, as I said, place to your strength. You have spent all these years gain a clinical access. You'll be surprised how many engineering students or professor are desperate to get clinicians to collaborate with them. So people like you are rare, because the many other clinicians are that all they do is see patients, make money, save lives, whatever it is. Some are altruistic, some are money maker, others are just doing a job. So the curiosity and desire to do research is limited. So your your type of people are would be a great asset and you'd be so lucky to meet up with them and they would be so lucky to meet up with you. So so keep your strength but then adapt. Now the thing is that you know a lot of things we learn we learn in our young age, great math skill, physics skill, very young age, same way you learn now that you didn't learn, you're not suddenly going to be become a mathematical genius. You're not going to be like this student with machine learning and all of that. But you can learn to apply machine learning to a medical problem. Yeah. So you, like in this course, if you learn a decent amount of vocabulary and comfort zone to the kind of things we are talking about, you know, like the first day's lecture might have come easy to you because it was biology and all of that. And then later sometimes when I start talking <coughs> graph theory, if I go into it, you don't even know what I'm talking about. So it's fine, but you have some idea what graph theory means. So you can have a collaboration like that. Now in the US for people like this, they are really top tier, very, very top tier. They can do MD, PhD. They can they do both medicine and PhD together. The trouble is it takes forever, many, many. In US, you go to medical school after undergraduate. So four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school, some fellow PhD, another three years, so eight, seven, eight years. Then maybe their residency is about 12 years. You are in your mid-30s before you are active. So it's an incredible commitment. There are others who do medicine and go into research, and the others who are PhD, but somehow manage to do more medically oriented research, somebody like me. Um, and so for me, it was possible coming from engineering to do more medical research by going to more medically intensive college. And I gave you the example of how I ran into a neuroanesthesiologist who study a problem on intraoperative or cardiologist about pacemaker defibrillator. So that's how. Uh, it started. For you, it can be the opposite, right? That if you are visible, make yourself available, you know, depending on your medical specialty, somebody might want to trace the medical device, do something, um, you know, reach out, you know, offer to give a talk, uh, you, you know, volunteerism is great, you know, I don't know which city are you in? Okay. So I'm, I'm not, obviously, I'm not famous, but let's let's take an example that you, you are a medical student in Kolkata, you know, reach out to some faculty here. I would like to come and give a talk about cancer or something, you know, because I'm a cancer specialist and I want to interact with people who are interested in cancer research. Yeah, and you, you know, there might be, you may or may not get a response, don't worry about it, but very likely you will if you reach the right person. So that's great, because like last night, there's a Professor Bijoy is a very senior advisor to Kharagpur and he's trying to guide the biomedical people and he's trying to help uh, set up the collaboration. And you know, one of the areas he sort of saw was cancer. So now a hospital in Calcutta and here, and I told him, build a, create a retreat, a collaborative symposium so that they talk to each other. Cancer people have their problems, engineers have their own technology or technique, something can happen. So these kind of things, it of course helps to be in the right place at the right time, you know. There is an advantage to being, for me, in Johns Hopkins or uh, even at NUS Singapore. Singapore is so high tech, so advanced, that running into people is advantage. But uh, you know, I don't see the physicians there as, not as always forthcoming at Johns Hopkins, but then I found selected ones were like that. They were terrific. That's it. That's my collaboration. So I think, uh, Play to your advantage, keep your medical training, but as again I was talking to Professor Devas, is it's here getting into certain residencies and M MD and MS is hard and after that practicing and all of that and you like research. <laughs> it does help to affiliate yourself with good institutions because they have a lot of resources and other smart, dedicated people. You know, I mean, the difference between top tier place and others is that top tier aims Everybody is 
very selective, high powered, hopefully very intellectual, research minded. That's why they went there. So they, and the AIMS may take up more advanced medical research problems and all of that likely. They will have excellent MRI or whatever facility. If you go to a less advanced place, they may not have the facility, the training of the people may not be so high. But I think I, I mean, and again, I, I'm just trying to be a bit, and I don't want to be too critical, but you see, I see the class that there are about 30% are highly engaged, highly curious people. And I see about 50% are occasionally curious, interested, but you could well be shy. I don't know why you're shy, but you are. And I see about 20% of you are here sitting, sleeping, nodding. You have n I have no idea why you are taking this class and suffering through for a week, right? So that's the way it is, right? Maybe you're taking because you need some credit or something and you're just sitting in it, get the credit, go. You will never do this again. So that's the way typical places are. There are always 10 to 30% are amazing, dynamic, eager, whether physicians or professors, and you link up with them, life becomes exciting because you engage with each other. And 10 to 20% don't care. Their life has some different priorities in life. I, you know, they have circumstances for all I know, you know. They may be poor, they have family problems, they got stuck in a wrong career, whatever the reason, that doesn't, you, ca you can't, a doctor who under certain things got, got into medical school and had no interest, not gonna help. So top tier places have, instead of 10 or 30 percent, maybe 50 percent are fantastic. And a bottom tier places, uh, maybe one chief doctor is fantastic and everybody is not. And you gotta find the persons and people. So it does go, you know, why people go to IIT or why they go to Johns Hopkins or MIT or something, because that's what they get where they go. In Singapore at NUS is top 10 ranked in many engineering. Not so top 10, 2050 or something or even worse in medicine, but it's pretty good still. So it helps because you run into really top tier people, right? So if you are aspiring, creative, ambitious, seek out similar people. Don't be deterred by somebody who's too famous or too important, too busy. I guarantee you those people are working harder than you and they are more alert and more eager. I, this young, I mean, I in a break, I quickly replied, well, I like this person who said, I'm excellent at probability theory and information and connectivity and I said, great, let's grab this smart young person. So, you know, just like you want something, we want somebody too, yeah? Okay, yes. So what would be the parameters for choosing our project? So we can be either be very much idealistic and think about something perfect or we can be too much narrow-minded and Excellent question. I think that's a, although I've given you more chocolates in the past. Yeah, excellent question. Sorry, sorry, I, I shouldn't do that. I should just pass it along, sorry. So, uh, so the thing is, that's an excellent question. I think that this is where like judgment, this maturity of judgment shows. Although there is a luck involved because sometimes where you end up, that's what you end up doing, right? What can you do? So, but, but let's assume that luck factor, leave it aside. You know, as I said, work with excellent people. You work with a professor, teacher who is unattentive, uninterested, abusive, it doesn't help. Be smart on who you choose, right? You can ask around, is the advisor good? Same thing when you look for industry or job, how is the company, is the company dynamic, op uh, welcoming places, or it's all about everybody there is, you know, whatever, from this part of the country and they help only those people and then owner is biased and, you know, it's not a great environment. Some companies make work you like crazy, others are very creative and nurturing. So knowing where you apply and where you, is, do your homework. I mean, don't, don't just go blindly into it being too innocent. Do a little checking around. If you are applying for grad school, how is this professor, how is the lab environment? Ask around from other students, get a feel for such a place. Now coming back to your question. How do you select the project? It's the same thing. Yes, I can see the whole pool how, you know, meaning of life on one end to making a little one channel ECG amplifier to record ECG, ancient, old problem, other one is un intractable. And you know, I think um, there are no short or simple answers, but you can imagine, again, I've given you Galileo as an example, right? I mean, unless you are Galileo and inventing a telescope, and even if you did, 
you can only address a problem that a low resolution optical telescope did and he has still discovered that Jupiter has so many moons right. So, it is not a bad thing it is amazing I mean he did not have to imagine black hole and go looking for them because he would not have had the tools and technology. So, it is not that I want to dampen your wide curiosity, but if you do not have rational tools and technology you are not going to answer the question it is going to be meaningless pursuit that is they are not going to go anywhere and before you know it you will have to have a good job, you will have to have a salary, support your life and you will say oh gee I can did not find meaning of life now what do I do and you achieve nothing. So, so I think you cannot stop dreaming of course, you should have a dream how does the brain work you know maybe I should work on billion neurons so that I can make a big impact and you are sitting in a lab where you cannot make a single electrode it is somewhat mismatched right. So, I think you it dreaming should be based on your foundation right. This again young man if he has such math foundation he can dream about I want to the deep learning is not so great it has some limitation I want to solve that problem or is there a deep learning network model of cortical layers seems like reachable target rather than how does the brain work right. So, dreaming is like that dreaming is based on foundation and you should feel like you are reaching out to something that yes I can reach it. If I could if I only somebody lifted me up gave me some money gave me some background some advice I could reach it. But you know does meditation increase my lifespan? How am I going to an rationally answer that question? I am going to do 10,000 people study them do I really know what kind of meditation? What is happiness? I mean these questions are not in not they are for discussion debate or you have to become a Harishi and like Gautam Buddha somewhere sit under the tree for 20 years maybe you can figure it out. So, work on rational problems is what I would at least I'm you have seen I am a bit more rationalist. Um, I would not work on very pedantic trivial problems there is too much of it seen here India is poor I need it for frugal health I need to do this poor people need poor cheap stuff that is not how it works poor people also have cell phone and cell phone was cheap poor that did had poor communication and poor quality design. So, battery discharge and they would not buy it people want quality you know even poor people want a good clean electrocardiogram so that they can record ECG you know. So, rich electrocardiogram machine a poor electrocardiogram machine the difference might be bells and whistles in US they will sell it with digitization and data will go on a cloud and uh, you know touch screen and all the fancy stuff and here it could be just on a piece of paper with some printout and diagnosis and instead of making it out of some amazing platinum box they will make it out of uh, you know plastic that is affordable and but functionally it still has to be good no poor people no Indians want second rate medicine or second rate devices there is a lot of you know like think of cars right. I mean a car is to take you from point A to B and you can work uh, sit in a high end Mercedes and BMW and spend 100,000 of 200,000 dollars and still go from point A to B and because of the speed limit and bump on the road you cannot go any faster and it is marginally more comfortable it is mostly what it is doing is pampering your ego. So, it it is expensive because of that and a relatively cheaper car it still gets you there under circumstances. Of course, extremely horribly made car which breaks down every time even poor people will not buy it because they know that is more trouble than it is worth. So, do not sacrifice on quality do not sacrifice on going on a low end it is not going to help do not reinvent old ancient iterative problem one channel. So, the student who came and asked he has got 2 3 months ECG single channel you could get stuck into some stupid trivial old problem, but you could even with that with the right advice find an exciting new approach. Single channel ECG with heart rate variability that takes data from Apple watch kind of application or you team up with somebody who makes flexible electrode or electronics to go on a pulse that is cutting edge something simple become cutting edge by good advice by good collaboration you can be cutting edge a lot really a lot depends on advisors you finding right advisor and challenging and interacting with them 
you know, I can see the half the class, you know, maybe it's cultural. I mean, whatever it is, you, you not, about half the class has not spoken up, right? How are you going to go to an advisor and ask the question, you know, but can we do better? Can I do this? I have this idea because you, your, your shyness or your timidity or indifference will prevent you from doing it and you'll be stuck with a stupid dumb project. And your advisor will treat you that way because they don't, your job, you'll not get a promotion because you've got to be dynamic. Ask, you know, like again, this young man, step up, ask curious question, engage respectfully. Yeah, yes, Indians have a little, I think, and you know, it's cultural, so I, it's not nothing wrong. Very high sense of respect, sir, this, that sometimes people stand up, all that is fine. An American is very different, everybody is on a first name and it's very casual, it's also okay, it's cultural. But beyond that, you as a student have a right to get a good education. So if the teacher is not teaching, you ask, can, I, can you explain this better? You can be respectful and still get your answers clarified. And if a really bad teacher says, shut up, no, no, I need to finish it, okay, well, you made a bad choice of the university or the teacher. Then you'll have to adjust. But otherwise, it, you'll get feedback. You know, I spent, so, take so much time. Do you have any questions? See, I came here not on a holiday. I even got a call, right? I came here to give you whatever my wisdom, experience, life lessons, knowledge. Take advantage of it, such situation. Those are priceless. Be similarly, a good mentor is priceless. There is absolutely the best way to get ahead in life. Good PhD advisor, good job manager or boss, good department director in a medical school who is nurturing, takes you up. And they have the wisdom to help you choose the right problem, give you the resources needed. Now, the only exception is the Ramanujan kind of geniuses because they are so much beyond these people that they can, no matter what, they'll be held back. Then even Ramanujan reached out to Hardy because he needed a mentor to guide, choose among maze of things, the assessing the importance of it. But local ones, Einstein was, if you have, uh, there's a TV Einstein series, which I'm sure very soon get into YouTube and all that, but it's about, it's called Genius, National Geographic. And a lot of it is about Einstein's personality, which is not as great as you would think. But he was, seriously held back by German professors who were very dogmatic. You had to do thermodynamics this way. And he, he was thinking that thermodynamics, but what about the molecules? He says, what about molecules? The molecule, he thought there was a lot of randomness and the German professor just clamped it down. And he was very frustrated and he fought it and stuck with it. In Switzerland, uh, something similar, he couldn't get into the PhD program because he totally excelled in some courses and it totally deserves everything and they wanted to have the total sum. It didn't work. So he became a patent examiner to make a living and did his best problems under adversity. So adversity is not an issue. So tho those are exception for any genius in the room. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, you, you should have an interest, you should have tools to work with. The docs here are not going to put up the math and engineers are not going to suddenly become surgeons. So work to your strength, build partnership, but find good mentors in good institutions. I think that's a kind of formula. Yes. Yeah. It's a kind of safe approach. Uh, it's not a bad, it's, see, suppose you, you know, like this young man applies to me. It sounds good, but I really don't know. So I, and he really doesn't know. I mean, somehow he found me. So we start off somewhere safe, known problem, re-implement it, do a minor variation. We always leave room for come up with your idea. See, every time I'm asking question, any questions, you know what I'm doing. I'm eager for a smart, brilliant, exciting, interesting question. Once in a while, somebody asked me about network and so on. Yes, this person is thinking, it's great. So it's how it is that smart mentors are also looking for smart young people to ideate and go forward. But you can't just walk in and dream up. What is your background? What's your credibility? So you, you would be disconnected with reality and therefore you can't implement it. That's again like in an engineer sense. I mean, if you haven't even 
taken differential equations, you can't do certain type of physics or such. And dreaming up of celestial mechanics and all that's meaningless, even though you're really curious about how planets and stars and all that work, you don't have as basic calculus. So that's why I'm saying that young people tend to kind of get carried away to far out where they have no begging. Even these sort of meaning of life type of questions, then you might at least take psychology and philosophy classes where great scholars have written something, you know, read Swami Vivekananda or read some Nisse or some famous people. So now you're beginning with some grounding about philosophy of life. Otherwise, you, you can these are just questions, right? So, so ground yourself and build on it. That's the safe route. But there's always room for imagination. There's always room for Ramanujan. And sooner or later, they'll, they'll be visible. Yes? Startups, like companies as a startup. Well, I, I I think his. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that uh, U.S. always always tends to be very entrepreneurial, and there is always room and in more investor money out there for startups. Uh, and Singapore is Singapore has become. I mean, if all, any country in the world that has had the most rapid trajectory in that direction in Singapore. A senior cities reach top 10, its per capita wealth is probably among the very highest other than one or two oil company, uh, countries. Uh, life expectancy is among the highest. They are, uh, you know, it doesn't have natural resources, so it's all very business entrepreneur and really education based. They value education so much, like anybody with high education from top tier is very heavily valued. So it has always been meritocracy and very excellent, but wasn't ever entrepreneur because it's kind of a bit of an Asian culture. Again, everybody's quiet, timid, not questioning, challenging. Entrepreneurs are bubbling with ideas and breaking normality, right? They have to invent something that doesn't exist. So they are always, as they call iconoclastic, these are the ones who are going to break glasses. They're going to do something that doesn't exist. So they have, they have to be, you know, even from question, I honestly don't see a single entrepreneur in the room because you just don't, haven't asked out of the boss. I mean, you have asked some outlandish question like what's dreams and all that, but you haven't asked what if, like, you know, and I did say yesterday, like startup, any one of you could have done that, right? Asked what could I do? So that it's a culture, it's an attitude. And I entrepreneur has a bubbling enthusiasm, a fervor to want to do something day and night. And that is, Culturally, very highly groomed in Israel. It's one of the most entrepreneurial company. Everybody's an entrepreneur. Everybody's adventurous. Bay Area, Silicon Area, it's also, everybody seems to somehow come up with ideas and it's a nurturing environment. Some universities like Stanford are very nurturing like that. And US Singapore is starting to do that. There's something called Block 71, so like crazy, lots of startup are coming in. But they're generally because they see machine learning, AI, so they're kind of like a herd, lots of people are going in that direction. So that's good because that's one way to get in because they want quick results. Bioelectronics on the road takes time to build the electronics, build into device, make it ready for medical use all the way. So it, it's a, this is not, this is like s solid stuff. Definitely there is, in, sing in US there are similar entrepreneurial ability, you know, you heard about Elon Musk and Neuralink. Uh, Singapore less so, but they, you know, again, it's, it's depending on how you look at it. Therefore, you can stand out, and you will be extremely difficult to stand out in Silicon Valley, because everybody's thinking of the cutting edge. The bioelectronic or electrochemical electromedicine is popular, and already by the big companies have jumped in. So, what is the little guy? What is the chance? You know, and so I think uh, entrepreneurship is you yourself and in a nurturing environment, <coughs> <coughs> early stage. Many places later on, you need investors, people who want to put in money. As I understand it, a lot of money is floating around in India and China, perhaps even more so than US and elsewhere. So it, it's the way I understand, not for high risk entrepreneurship, but rather just, you know, because India and China is getting wealthier. That doesn't mean masses, population is getting wealthy, but there's a lot of money from very people who are very rich. So there is a culture of investment and entrepreneurship. My own son, after graduating from Berkeley, 
and did a startup and now he's with a company called Lyft which is similar to Uber and he's dropping out. He's not very satisfied with that and he wants to probably do some startup or something. He's going to come to Bangalore to explore what possibilities are there. Maybe grass is greener elsewhere. Maybe he sees a better opportunity than in being in San Francisco. I don't know. It's his choice. My point is that opportunity is there. If the area is sparse, you would be the king and you would be the one noticed. If you go to the place where everybody is there, you have to try even harder to shine in it. So, you know, you, you have to just weigh it. Sometimes, I mean, you know, if there's a simple answer, won't everybody follow the formula? So right now, everybody has a simplistic answer. Do AI, deep AI, do this and this and that. You know, before that, it was apps. And before that, it was smartphones. So, you know, the great breakthroughs are where people th thought nonlinearly. Yeah, I mean, obviously, people who are, you know, this is like in cricket being an all-rounder. I mean, they are there, and they are very successful sometimes. But otherwise, most people specialize, right? Fast bowler, slow bowler, opening batsman, middle order, you know. By and large, most of us are mortals, and we tend to specialize. So, frankly, even for Amar Bose or anybody, it's never exactly equal. You know, so one scenario is that you're a professor and you have had ideas, but through your entrepreneurial students or collaborator or some friends, you spin off that idea into a Bose company. Yeah, it, it doesn't, you didn't make a company and run it operating day to day, at least in its growth and big phase. Or he leaves and he just gives guest lecture pro bono teaching at MIT. He cannot work at the top tier performance of a tenured professor at MIT. He is running both, he is the inventor, he is respected, his knowledge is respected by MIT. So, comes in, he a get a, gets a courtesy lecture and be visiting. So, I think that is too high an expectation. Again, entrepreneurship is mostly a matter of young people who are willing to take risk. In the beginning, you are working very hard, you are poor. If you guys are playing safe, every day you need to go home come to the class at 9.30 instead of 9, you're not an entrepreneur, you are living. Entrepreneur would be here at 7 a.m., leave at midnight, doesn't care about food or money, but thinks nonlinearly, asks a bunch of questions. The professors are in the same way. They are some amazingly brilliant nonlinear thinkers are the ones who go out, get Nobel Prize, all that, but others are linear. They have to write research grants, write proposal, get grants, support PhD, teach, do all that. So, each to their own ability, do not generalize, look at yourself, because it does not really matter what Amar Bose does or me. In my case, as an example, I mean, you know, I, when I graduated IIT, like everybody else, I was thinking of, I need to apply to graduate school. And I started, I took a GRE and all that. And then I, in by November, December, I heard some alumni come in and talk about their startup. I was, I was so fascinated by the idea, I said, I should do that. And I stopped up going, applying, going to grad school. By January, February, I said, hold on. I'm not from a business family. Where is the money? Like, what am I doing startup on? And I took a young person, immature, didn't take mentoring. Mentoring wasn't as available. Then I found a nice, safe, well-paying job with Philips. It was very well-paying, safe job. I did for two years and still kept looking for ideas for entrepreneurship, but I wasn't getting there. The job was pretty boring. It was well-paying, but it's monotonous. And um, I wasn't like, I didn't knee, knew how to make money like some real business people do. And even in Philips, I was teaching people what to do, this to do. I said, I'm a research guy. So I applied to grad school, did research. But I had that some instinct for entrepreneurship. And so my students have spun off companies. I'm co-founder, whatever it is, you know, esoteric stuff. I don't have to run the company at all. I'm just an advisor. So pr many professors work at that level, even in US a top tier place. They are advisor to the spin off from the lab or the students. Because otherwise, and there are some cases at some point it is so good it requires fully the involvement. They give up the professorship and go to the company. And you know, and then they can keep a foothold in a university for respect, for attracting good students. So they come and become guest lecturers. So nowadays some awesome people at Google may have a 
courtesy appointment at Stanford or Berkeley, is where they come and teach and give lectures and be role models. Yeah, so you know it's it's tough, but yeah, I mean I think a tougher question is teaching and research. In India, teaching requires a lot of demand, and then to do research and then do entrepreneurship. But again, people do it. How hard you work, how smart you are, opportunities, mentors, they all play a role. You can control hard work, right? Any one of you can come here at 8 o'clock. You'll do better. So I think half the class has chosen to be poor. I mean, you have. I mean, I, know, and I don't want to be negative. That's your choice because you come late, don't ask any questions. And when I ask rich and poor, various reasons, you just said, so you're going to get a standard working job and make a life. And maybe you're happy with that. That's all you want. I mean, it's nothing wrong with it, but that's how it's going to be. And about a 20% or 30% of my choice of constantly checking and questioning. So therefore, that DNA is hopefully will carry over. And in your job and career, if you make good decisions with good mentors, things will be better. So you know, that's how it works. So you know, follow, follow your passion. But good that you're thinking, looking at role models like Bose. But again, you have to be reasonable. I mean, nothing wrong with it. But Bose might be so exceptional. I mean, me giving Ramanujan's example to this class might be just pointless because Ramanujan's kind of people happen once a hundred years. So maybe I should find a reasonable example of hey, so and so was a silver medalist and did this and that, right? Okay? Yeah. Let me take different people's question first, if anybody else, then come back to you the other people. Yeah, I mean, I sort of, I think I've answered the question, but I'll try again. I think there is each side, let's cut it, consider two sides, medical and engineer, professor and student. You know, each side thinks they don't have something, other people, but how do I reach to them? But they don't realize it that what's important to them, you may have and may take advantage of it. See, I'm sitting as a famous professor at top institution with funding and all the things, you know. A student will be very timid, um, I don't want to, it's too busy. I always get this, I'm too busy, I'm not busy, I work like crazy. I'm instantly reacting to such things. I'm rapid, energetic, and I have a very high interest in attracting that smart young man or young lady, right? So I, I need her or him as much as they need my internship. So same thing applies medicine engineering, your clinical know-how. That other young student who asked me about his single finger pulse measurement, so he's trying to predict from that heart attack. Well, set them straight. You know, what is a heart attack, which is a coronary vessel? Coronary vessel is a tiny vessel in the heart. Why would it show as a pulse in your finger? Now, if you have heart failure or ejection fraction is low, it might show up. So start a dialogue like that. And they should reach out to you and you should have a help. And they say, well, I, you know, I can't do it. I just have, what is that patient available? Only students. Come to my hospital. I'll hook you up with a bunch of patients. There's a mutual partnership, right? So I think it's that, it's a pretty uh, straightforward thing. So Professor Bijoy and so on, I told him, you know, with this hospital in Calcutta, build a, do a workshop. In general, he also said, physicians are too busy. Well, come on, I'm busy too. And every smart, hardworking, successful person is, remains busy. If they're not busy, they'll find something else to busy with. So you want, to, want them to be busy with your great idea or ability. It's not like they're busy because they're, they're, they're saying, on a today, what should I be busy with? What makes me rich and famous? You know, and a, some stupid thing I'll try to avoid. So they're not bu too busy in general. Any case, you know, if they're super so busy, obviously, you have to respect and find somebody else. There's always, just like you, a dissatisfied, professor and young engineers, come and visit and give a talk, offer to give a talk, give a tutorial. I want to give a tutorial on physiology and pathophysiology of heart, let's say. I think the Kharagpur Medical School, they will bunch of students sit in the room. And one luckily, one professor, oh, you know, that's great. They know we are building this machine. You say, come over and I'll test it for you. Things can get started and vice versa. Okay, it's all about, let's see, four, five thirty. Oh, wow. We are sort of falling behind, uh, but three, four more minutes. There were two questions I'll answer rather quickly. Sir, when you follow tech trends, there is more about innovation and business. When you follow Indian portal, there is more about business and profit. I would like to mention, so is it uh, really important to focus innovation in this market? Yeah, so first of all, I'm not 
such an expert, but I think my perception is similar to yours. You know, it's economy, it's culture. What he's saying is some places, they focus on tech and innovation and through that entrepreneurship and through that wealth. Other places, just wealth and profit. It doesn't matter whether it's new or not, just do it, make money. Uh, you know, I, it's, I think it's societal, cultural thing. Uh, it is why people migrate to places like US and Singapore because that's where they can thrive. You know, so many immigrants have done so amazing things in when they've gone abroad because Indian culture, society may hold back. Of course, there are rare people who still shine here. There are billionaires in India, but they've got become billionaires through business. And there are amazing professors also who have been who are world class. But yes, the culture, the environment can well hold it back, right? I mean Rather than come in India and China, let's pick India and US, let's pick on China or something. You know, general stereotype is no protection of IP, steal and copy, make oodles some money. So that's the stereotype. But Chinese universities are really rapidly getting top tier. Indian universities left behind, no chance. You know, they are also, you know, in today's times or whatever the newspaper was, the percentage of money given to research. You know which country is number one? Korea. Four and a half percent of GDP. Number two, by just a little bit, Israel. Somewhere in about five to ten ish, five to ten is US. India might be like 90 or 100, and China might be somewhere below. So, the point is that their cu cultures, countries, society make certain thing, and today's world, people migrate for that reason. That's not necessarily true because I didn't say that they are necessarily investing in fundamental research. So I didn't say that. They, I said they're investing in research, but most likely Korean investment is applied R&D that is corporate driven, Samsung and all those things, not fundamental research for pure molecules and genes and whatnot. So Japan has a bit of that culture. It could change. The, these Asian countries are also very kind of goal driven. We must have a Nobel Prize, you know, and so they might <coughs> one way or the other, but it's, you can't, and there's a fallacy there, we can, you can't get Nobel Prize that way, otherwise people can write a program to write, get a Nobel Prize, right? AI for Nobel Prize. So uh, I, I think not, that's a very deeply rooted cultural thing that comes from that. Uh, the if you look at the Nobel Prizes, particularly in physics, physiology, medicine, extremely high percentage is Jewish, why? You know, something in the bringing, cultural, whatever it is. In India, you know, right? Gujaratis are like, I'm Gujarati, you know, it's a business. Educator like me is not so common. The other parts are Bengalis are more typically scholarly, historically at least. You know, and so there are certain cultural and socio political, they constrain you sometimes, right? Even if you were, there's a huge all over dis discussion, very much so in US about disparity between men and women, salaries. Why are so few women in engineering? It's a classical problem, right? Why? There are no simple answer, but that's <coughs> <coughs> most of them are cultural. <coughs> <coughs> young girls at very young age might have said, oh, don't do math, it's too hard. They sap their enthusiasm. No, you don't want to go to engineering, but then you won't get a good husband, all that. That can hold them back. And before you know it, you lost the early spark. Uh, there might be discrimination. But more often than not, in places like India, it's very cultural. It's at least for extreme case, let me take Middle East, right? I mean, how many women are going to come out in science and technology, building full burqa and with all the inhibition? So it's a quite often, more often than not, it's very cultural and societal. What about Iran and China? Sorry? Iran and China. Done what? No, no, no. She is an Iranian migrant who went to Stanford as she is a professor. It's she is hardly Iranian. She did undergrad. That's why I'm saying that there are exceptions just like that. 10, 20 percent of IIT students are young women who are as smart and brilliant as there are professors, as there are leaders of the institutes. A very small percentage and she managed to read that by going to Stanford. So to get out so that she could bloom. That's why I told you that if the current culture environment doesn't permit you, you, you migrate to where you can. 
but there is always the exception. You cannot make exceptional rules. I'm not, I'm not talking about exceptions. Ramanujan exception, that young lady is a far exception. I mean, those people are so exceptional that doesn't create a role model for any of us. It, it's just one of those completely exceptional things. There's no point in reading Einstein saying, I'll be an Einstein. You know, it's such an exceptional thing. You learn from them certain adversity Einstein overcome. He fought it out even with his advisor. For this young lady who, uh, you know, the Iranian who got still medal, she migrated. She, there is associated biography, is constant discussion. Why aren't, I think she's the only female still medalist. So why aren't women, you would think genetically God, they shouldn't have made any differences. So it's hugely cultural bias. Why aren't some of you asking questions and others are constantly curious. So it's social, cultural, political. What, you know, those are things that are sometimes beyond that. People like me take a deep breath and, you know, move on. Because not everybody can be a genius. Not everyone wants to be rich and not everyone wants to be famous. That, that's an exception too. But those who have those fervor can become great entrepreneurs, great scientists. They find a way. They get out. They go do things. Last question. I think I'm over time. Yes. That's not dynamic, that's hard working. Okay. Or we can have a very set pattern of routine for everyday life. That's, that's also nothing dynamic, that's discipline. They're both okay, they're personal traits. They are great successful people through incredible discipline who have a terrific schedule, time management, priority, and great. And they're completely eccentric, genius people who have very odd lifestyle and do great things. It's very personal. By and large, the attributes are going to be hardworking, eclectic, dynamic, and brave or bold about what they do. Dynamic doesn't mean show off and talk. I mean, some of you could be shy and dynamic in your own way of problems you might solve. So some of a lot of that is a bit personal. I mean, you, you just have to go with your own thing. I mean, if your body cannot get up, there, there are people who are early risers and person here gets up at 5 a.m. and goes running. And most of you have trouble coming in at 9 o'clock. Either you're lazy, not so interested, or your body is late. You're up till 2 a.m., but you're not. So you have to respect your body a little bit. But I mean, see, we can control what we can, and we can control hard work. We can't control God-given IQ or something. So that we work with what we've got. We have great math skills, and he's got great experimental skills, and he's a great surgeon. We work with their skills. The hard work you can control. Communication skills you can learn. I mean, some people are born not to be shy and some people are shyer, but I used to be very shy, you know. I was shy or not because I was shy. I was very nerdy, as Americans put it. You know, I was studying all the time. I love to solve math problems all that. So I don't need to waste time with talking to people. But later on, at some point you realize that's not gonna get me anywhere, get out. So when I work, suddenly you realize you have to network, you have to talk, you have to share your abilities and ideas. So that helps. Sheer genius, even if you're eccentric, will eventually rise to the top. But even Einstein was hugely held up in a better circumstances. At his peak, those two, three years where he wrote the greatest of these papers, what if it was he didn't have to work in the patent office? Again, you read that, it was, he was held back. By the time he was recognized and went to Princeton and so on, I mean, the great work was behind it. He was working on grand unified theory and all that, but didn't really make a headway. So it was that genius of that youth was gone. This is the best of the times. This is this is it. Uh, it's downhill from now. So yes. Okay. Last last. Sir, uh, there's a system to professions in India, mm -hmm. and certain professions are hierarchy. Certain are hierarchy. Yeah. Certain are hierarchy. Yeah. So ideas when getting lower down the hierarchy are considered <coughs> to be not very important or like buried down in there. So is there anything that well, see, I'm not sort of socio political religious expert, so it's just these are my. You know, I mean, again, like I said, I have to put a disclaimer in all honesty so that if I'm not an expert, it's just an opinion, right? If you ask a narrow neurotechnology, these 3D micro nano, I can at least give some expertise because I'm an expert. So I'm, I've left India a long time ago. I'm not expert on it. So I just think of it as a human being. 
Yeah, I mean, society is never fair and perfect and open-minded as you'd like it to be. And India, more than many other countries, is hierarchical. There's, you know, there's class system and there is a wealth system and there's a cultural system and bureaucracy that is hierarchical. And those, those are the reasons why Indians and don't achieve their full potentials because there are many in structural barrier. I mean, like a simple metaphor would be traffic in Calcutta. I mean, if I can be as smart and I can have the fastest car in the world and I can be a race driver, but in a crowded streets of Calcutta or Delhi or Bombay, I can't go any faster. So that structural barrier is going to hold me up. Okay, so what am I to do? So I give that, that example. Well, I don't drive race cars in Calcutta, but maybe I can do something else, you know? And so what is that something else that could make you better? And you can thrive and survive. Uh, what is that? Uh, Sam Petroda's name as an example, right? In, when I was young, to get a f telephone in Mumbai was about 15, 20 year wait system. Because the government had the same notion as I told you about car. So he sit in the line, there's a lot of corruption, you don't do it, you just sit there. He just bypassed it and came, you know, instituted the mobile system that got over it. Why is the internet and all that is thriving in India? Because it's bypassing the infrastructure. So there's a way. So you need to kind of start being a bit nonlinear to buy because there are a lot of people, sometimes they are self-righteous, want to change the system. This is all wrong, I'm going to fight it out. And you, you basically bruise yourself, you hurt other people, other people hurt you. Sometimes change occurs like that. That's how British went. A lot of people died. Gandhi came with the peace movement. There's no simple answer. They were both, Bhagat Singh fought and Gandhiji did a peaceful thing, right? So there were both ways to get over a system that was holding back India. So you have to decide whether, which way you want to go. But if you take the Petroda example to bypass, you can. Okay. rather sophisticated question, but that electroshootical is doing exactly that. That some of these nerves, they reduce inflammation exactly that way because they stimulate the nerve, retrograde, it goes to the brain, releases certain cytokines that affect the whole molecular cascade to reduce inflammation. The same group is now working on a way to become, make it anticoagulant. It changes the way blood clots. So th that kind of field is completely pot potentially. This whole gut, gut as a neural axis potentially is going to bring out new ideas. So it's a excellent emerging field. Now whether the devices play a role is not as strongly clear as it was for the heart or brain, because it can be molecular, it can be genetic, it can be stem cell, I mean many ways to attack it. But I think this is a more open field, more chance to do a, have a breakthrough, more risky. Okay? All right. So we can be more back to linearity, uh, you know. I, please do come to me if you have question about how to become poor and less famous. <laughs> don't talk, don't ask question, fall asleep, come late, all those things. Miss the class, Miss the class <laughs> you know. Okay, so how do I get to my presentation again? So I think it's a bit of a uh, repetition. So in a way, I think we should be able to get fast, uh, get through fast. Because, you know, like I said, I learn by it and I teach by repetition. And also, <coughs> um, you know, it's the point is not that somebody is going to, is one of you is going to do exactly sensory motor processes. It's how it did, the beauty of it, you might apply to endocrinology or whatever it is, or materials for physics. But understand how the how the interesting research gets done. <coughs> so basically, now you need to understand that neuroprosthesis as a field is really hot. There are a lot of startups, a lot of faculty positions are opening up in countries like US and elsewhere, people who do cutting edge research. You know, companies like GSK and drug companies are getting into this. And so for reason, because technology has come forward, our physiology understanding is good, and devices are good because they work, if they don't work, they don't hurt you like a drug. So it naturally started with sensory and motor. Motor, arm moves, anyone could relate to it. 
It just that we all of this happened for 10, 15 years back in US or has been happening and it still is happening. So the Indians and Chinese are getting hang of, hey, I want to do neuroprocessors. So now they're catching the peak of the wave or downside of the wave. Uh, but it's enabled by, as you know, notice technology. And this is the new emerging wave. Take these nerves and what can you treat disease with, which is only early stage, high impact papers, so on, and the news will trickle down slowly. So I showed you this video, which is a good example of sensory motor, right? Motor, sensory, so I don't want to show it again. You saw this. this. There is a sensory motor going on too, right? I mean, he's thinking, the nerves are carrying a message, they're going to the muscles, you decode, move the arm. The motor has been done, sensory is plausible, they have done some mapping, but hasn't been pursued big way. You know, none of this is fully implanted, automated, so this has some more ways to go. It is, it is a rather interesting technology. I showed you this video where, in this case, there is a nerve damage and we can restore function. So you're becoming, you've always must have thought, this is a course in brain neurotechnology, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, there's nerve. And by the way, I left a huge gap on spinal cord. You know, I can't cover everything, but you, you realize that if you want to be distinct, start, make your startup, don't go up against big guys, they're doing brain, maybe you can do nerve related. You know, so there are, in research, the same way, people have been building DMI forever for last 10 years, about million Chinese are building DMI system out of online, you're not gonna make a big impact start being a little different. So we chose this problem as an example. So, so as an example with nerve damage, so what happens if the nerve gets damaged like this, nerve is cut and the signals are not going. Well, when the signals are not going, the nerve starts getting damaged. And then the muscles, no message, so muscles atrophy. And person's limb gets disabled. So what if you could connect and build the bridges? Suddenly we got this problem. So now we realize that nerves actually regenerate, right? So you see the Lord, those axons are regenerating. So one approach could be to make the nerves grow, regenerate. Other approach is to build bridges, electronic or otherwise. So here's an example of video of a nerve, axons. Axons bundled together is a nerve. So in a micro devices, this, uh, you're gonna see axons growing, but we're gonna crush it somewhere, you know? So here is this growing axon and see what happens when we crush it, like a nerve injury. It starts retracting, kind of like snake, snake, you jump on a snake and it retracts, then it bundles up, breaks up, and see it broke up, all this little tiny island. You know, that is what nerve injury does, and then that's it, nerve is damaged. Now I have another video which I don't have it here, but after a long time, the nerve will regenerate. So fundamental science people study things like this, why, what happens, all of that, but you see, Nerve injury does occur. I think this is the one, oh, this one is okay. Uh, it's just uh, injury. Uh, I'm not sure how it's gonna come. Yeah, you see, here's that exon. After injury, it's trying to grow, do something. It's, it's trying to struggle to grow into something. Um, spinal cord injury. Why does spinal cord injury, so think about this is a spinal cord, an injury occurred here. So what happens with spinal cord? It grows. Wherever the injury, it goes back. It cannot cross over on this side. Because the, the, the damage of the spinal cord prevents the axons to grow through the damage. You have to kind of break through the damage. It's kind of like a wall. Although here we did an artificial wall, but in reality, it can be other kind of molecules, they broke it. There's no growth factor was to grow. There are other CPG is the one that blocks it. Yes? Sir, uh, it didn't pass the injury. So no, in this case, so I, it's blocked, so we didn't create an injury. This is like a spinal cord. We synthetically created a situation like this. So it's known that injury in a spinal cord releases the molecules called CSPG. They are reason mostly for inflammation, getting rid of the debris and so on. But they in turn become the nuisance because they block. The axons cannot get over the gradient of CSPG. So a poor thing has no choice but to go back. And it's I mean, going back or it's winding somewhere else. So, so that's why spinal cord injuries cannot get repaired because the block is e not so easy to overcome. I showed you this video of neuromuscular junction, so I think uh, you see my point. But in vivo, it is possible to restore function. You've seen this video or, uh, you know, and so what happens is that 
devices can help overcome the function. So we need devices like this for coil, for energy and data, electronics, wiring, so on. You've seen all of that. In a monkey, you've seen that if you stimulate, you can get the function back. So you know, this is a little micro stimulation and thumb and fingers are moving. Or, um, and I've shown you this video to capture the nerve signals. So in essentially taking nerve as an example, you know, we could create a bionic link which is record and stimulate and cover the gap, but you could also create conduit so the nerve has a way to go. You could also put growth factors and a lot of other ways. People have tried everything. Biologically, it's not ac possible to accurately do the connection. Technically, it's, ne it's not easy to reproduce the original signal to here. So all of these are challenging. Um, so here, a lot of devices I've shown. Um, you know, I don't think I showed it here, but usually this video comes in beginning of my talk. This was exactly the video, Star Wars, first Star Wars came when I was a grad student. Luke Skywalker, his arm, they gave an artificial, this thing, you see it has sense of touch. And he's reacting, cosmetically the hand looks appropriate, mechatronically the hand is, you know, but they've, they've created a cosmetic covering that is lifelike and that. Well, you know, amazingly, after 30, 40 years, 30 years, this is a quite reality. It's quite completely doable. So if you have that imagination, you skip classes and gone to these movies. That's why I'm saying that for one person like that, anything goes. The rest of you, forget it. Okay, so sensory information. Can we put sense of touch in an arm, right? So what is sense of touch? So my sound. Uh, let me play it again. So the sound is those nerve fibers, those little action potential we are converting into sound. So it gives you a feeling of the message. So there is there is this indentation which is that touch to the skin that is model. One of you is asking about the model. <coughs> this is electrical simplest simpler what is called finite element model of the skin. <coughs> so when you give indentation, they are creating these pressure points, right? So at those pressure points, the nerves are going to feel the pressure. And when they feel the pressure, they are firing and they are carrying the message of sense of touch. So can we use that sense of touch for a prosthetic? Well, yes. So what is the sense of touch? So in a skin, this is what it looks like. This is a skin surface. There are different layers. This is your surface, but right underneath, there are different types of sensors or receptors, as they're called. Messina, they are named after famous people, Messina, Pacinian, Merkel, and Ruffini, right? So you see that two of them are top. So they are obviously likely to be more sensitive, right, for light stuff. Two of them are below. So they are likely to be less sensitive, but might take high level of pressure and all of that, right? Similarly, some are what are called fast, FA, fast. They adapt, I touch and I feel it. The others, oh, I feel the pressure after a while. And you see how the nerve signals became active for this one just now, and this one continuously. So their skin has this multiple redundant system. So can we put that in a processes? Well, we did. This is a multi-layer sensor like a skin. I put an object in it. So when I do that, these nerves are firing. <coughs> From this, I reconstruct the object. So you can see that it's reconstructing. My, my brain chip is decoding that and saying it's a tape or it's a pen. <coughs> you see, I mimic, in a sense, neuromorphic. So this is, we'll, you'll see this tomorrow also. I'm going fast, so I just want to <coughs> <coughs> introduce the topic. But you know, you have this pen, lots of nerve signals, brain kind of decodes, spatial, temporal, makes it, then this thing classifies and tells what it is. So um, this is the way the sensor was made. It's in a large sensor array. So here, if I put my hand on it, you see the hand profile. 
All right, let's pause. What can I, if I made a sensor like this, what can you do with it? Come up with an idea. Find an application. You saw this, I'll, I'll play, play the video again. Oh, this is, this is a little bit more advanced stuff. Let's stay to medical if possible. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but yeah, I don't know about surveillance, exactly what it means. It's possible. But I mean, why do I need this high resolution profile system? You, you can continue. I don't want, if I say no, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know what, what, what is your background? Yeah. Medical. You see what's going on? Two medical people and your physics background or oh, medical. Why do you need engineers? I mean, half the engineers are sleeping in the class. Why do you need them? See, you guys came all the way from Delhi, right? You came from Delhi, you came from where do you? You're from here. That's okay. We can accept Karakpur is a jail, you are stuck in it, you couldn't get out, so <laughs> where can you go? See, my point is, see, see, you answered your own question. They don't know what to do with it. You know what to do with it, right? So Da Vinci is a robotic surgery system, state of the art. Robot goes in and like a robotic, you, it's a telemanipulation. So a surgeon operates on a console, moves it, does this usually used for uh, <coughs> prostate, few other things, doesn't have sense of touch. So if, if that robotic fingers hand has sense of touch where it's, I mean, which surgery you could do without feeling, right? Even a brain, you're poking, tumor is hard, this, you, but you need to give a feeling back. How do you give the feeling back? Engineers, physicists, how do I give the feeling back? I raise hands and do it. I can. You need to raise hands and do it. Otherwise, I cannot follow all of us. So let's start. The no, that's the true. But what's the feedback? What What is the feedback? We could provide some uh, resistance. Like it would be a. I mean, if your uh, something is there and it's not there, but in. Uh, the what is the look? It. This is a touch sensor. What gives feedback? It's all sensory feedback. What type of what is called a transducer? Shift gives. How do you give? What what physical what device gives pressure? Piezoelectric actuator. Maybe it's vibrating, giving a sense of feeling. See, you guys get together. Now the engineers are front row. Engineers are waking up, or sort of. I hope you are. You're not an engineer, right? See, there you go. I. I'm coming to an IIT and engineers are not to be found. I don't know what's going on. But you see what it is. You come up with the solutions and suddenly now we can be starting, you know, like think about in India, breast cancer palpation. I mean, that's a very sensitive topic, right? So what if a machine were doing palpating? Many women in a rural area might be willing, right? That's how you serve poor people, not by making cheap, stupid technology, but now where since you know, doctors are not in supply, you were saying the ratio of medicine physician is extremely low. Why would they go to rural India? Now, what if they had a machine, you know, artificial hand that was palpating and that information like this pictorial is sent back to a physician and say, oh yeah, that seems like a bump. You're saying so. Right, so that's exactly the scenario I described, yes. Conceivably, I don't know why I would need it because if I can do it this simply, I don't need a robot electronic sensor and put $10,000. Sorry? An objective and a continuous. Yeah, so this is why you got to be a bit business like. Again, I can do it for a minute in a cheap, so I don't end the aesthetic perception. So sometimes you don't want to sell, solve it. That's, that's also often quite a tendency for engineers to get a little bit overly technical about it and then solve a problem that 
does not exist. Although you could argue that you have to do 1000 students are coming in, screen them, robotic hand goes down, touch, 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 palpation, go next, maybe you can improve productivity. That is arguable. Yeah, it might be, yes. Correct, you could go into heat sensing and all of that, right. So, so far I just saved touch. So, that is called nonlinear thinking, right. So, you are thinking outside because I you got locked into touch and you think about pulpate perception or temperature. Engineer, so how do you measure temperature? Okay, so thermocouple, thermistor. How do I relay the temperature back to the person? What is the device that creates a sense of heat or cold? No, thermostat is also a temperature sensor. It is if it is high temperature, it trips. Physicist, what is a it's named after some French guy. No, Seebeck effect is very different. Peltier, Peltier cooling heating device, kind of like okay, it is you apply voltage, one side heats up, one side cools up. So, now if you have temperature and link it to a Peltier, you could relay perceive temperature. I do not know why you would need it and maybe there is some circumstance out there, but you know it is quite possible right. You see everything is possible. Okay, I, I sort of I think it is close to 6. So, this is how these touch sensors work because you know they produce more like code and uh, you know they work well because see I can put a robotic hand the touch sensors on it. They produce this sort of nerve like activity and then you know it works well. I showed you this video of fast and slow, so that when you touch it, you get this fast and slow feeling. So, I will save that, save this all for tomorrow. And so, clinically, this is the kind of highlight like cutting edge I have said that you can actually do that. So, this is in this patient, this is a group from Switzerland. They you see this patient has an artificial arm, is wearing this is the artificial hand, they are keeping his eyes closed and they have this wiring is a direct wiring to the nerve. And so, when when a object is given is it like a soft or hard object based on the feedback the patient is able to separate it. So, it is saying hard, soft, ok. So my audio is not working, but it is hard, medium, soft. So, now <coughs> they have relayed these kind of information to the sensor. So, the electrode went into the nerve and you know it is a engineer, doctor that is kind of a team you know it, it they managed to make it happen. Uh, well, I do not think so. I think this is all big European Union project EPFL, um, but, but really it is a bit of a uh, I would not call it scam, but a bit, a bit of over exaggeration. In Europe just like India we are saying you need to have a company participation. So, in Europe also they want to have company participate. So, these are typically small startups done by students or professor they are not none of them is anywhere known or established. I would not even know if anyone exists now. Uh, so, it is a bit of a oversell to think that a lot of these companies because how many people need a nerve stimulation to feel a sense of touch. So, there is not big money to be made. So, this is very altruistic <coughs> ok we may end with the quiz. <coughs> oh ok that means it is telling me go home you know because you know at the end of the day giving quiz is such a bad idea. All right, see you all tomorrow morning, okay.